Right, and I should preface this by two things. One is, I'm a New Yorker by birth and raising, and so I'm a fast talker. So I have a lot to say, and I'll probably say it quickly. So I feel like the tone of everybody else's talks has been very calm and measured, and get ready for a, a fast ride. So <laughs> the other I should say is that the sort of subtitle of this talk should be, is what we're doing in the classroom, does it even matter? So all of these different things we've been talking about in terms of instructional strategies, is it worth our time? And so, spoiler alert, yes. Um, so what I'm going to talk about are two different sets of research, all based around this project called GARNET. And GARNET is, uh, of course, a great acronym, Geoscience Affective Research Network. Um, and we uh, sampled data from classrooms in introductory geology classrooms across the country. Uh, our primary goal, essentially, was to look at what our experiences for our students are in those introductory geology classrooms to better understand can we do things to improve their motivation and use of strategies within the classroom. Um, the data set is probably one of the largest of this type in the country for any given domain, or really within the literature as a whole. Uh, we looked at a variety of institutional types, and we also have a pretty large data set. So for those who like to do statistical analysis, it's somewhat enviable numbers here. Um, and from that, we can actually do some pretty powerful analyses. So that's kind of exciting. Um, so to kind of give some context, when we think about teaching our classes, we tend to think about it from the context of who are our students? What are they bringing into the experience? What are their prior knowledge? What are some of their background experiences? And what are we doing in the classroom? What are we teaching? What's our content? How many students do we have in the classroom? And that ultimately leads to, how do they do? Do they want to take another class? All of those different aspects that we sort of ultimately think about as course outcomes. But what the research shows is that that's mediated by motivation and by use of strategies. So are they, do they have an expectation that they're going to be successful in the class? And do they value the content? So those would be some of the motivation aspects. Um, and then what kinds of meta strategies, the metacognition, things like that, what are those different aspects, the strategies that they're employing within the classroom, those ultimately influence some of those course outcomes. So those are some of the individual aspects that students bring. Um, we can kind of think of it from motivation, we can think of it from interest, their perceptions of their capabilities, we can think about it from their own cultural experiences and how they identify with a particular domain, uh, from prior experiences, the strategies they're employing, all of that's the individual student. But of course, they're still in the context of, oh, sorry. And so the particular framework, theoretical framework that this research is applying to is what we call the expectancy times value framework. So that's a multiplicative function. So expectancy, do you expect to be successful in the class? And do you value the content? If either of those fall to zero, student motivation falls to zero. So you need to kind of think about it from the standpoint of you need to tend to both of those for students to be successful. There are many, many different motivational theoretical constructs. This is the one that I'm operating under for this research. Um, but it does, of course, operate within the context of where they are. So both the institutional support as well as the classroom itself. Um, and this is through notions of integration. So how connected do these students feel to both their institution and how connected do they feel to other students in the classroom? So there's that social network aspect. Um, and so within the institution, things like clubs, sports, those types of events help them to feel connected to their institution. Um, but also, what kind of community is created within their classroom? What kind of pedagogical content it, or sort of experiences allow them to engage in the content? And how does that allow them to feel connected to the content and where they're learning that content? But of course, when I think about it for my two-year college students, many of them are working full-time, they have family obligations, they have things that take them away from that institution. And so institutional type ultimately matters because that affects how students can relate to their institution. So I also want to kind of look at it from that broader perspective. So now, this is a lot of data to look at. I'm just focusing on this part of the diagram. So we're just kind of looking at the problem space over here to better understand those interactions. There are other questions that could be asked. Those are just the ones I'm sort of focusing on here. Why do we care about two-year college students? I'm passionate about them. Why should you? Well, of course, we talk about notions of STEM being underrepresented in terms of minority populations for a number of other different populations as well. If we look at two-year colleges, they are more diverse than students at four-year college universities in terms of STEM programs. Specific to the geosciences, we can say geology is one of the least diverse domains. Um, and more importantly, when we look at our introductory geology classrooms, students at two-year colleges 
are more diverse than students at the four-year counterparts. So our sort of potential pool of students that we can potentially draw into the geosciences is a more diverse population at the two-year colleges. So if we want to make geology more diverse, then we need to start thinking about where are those more diverse students spending time. Um, now, one of the challenges at two-year colleges, it's not unique to two-year colleges, but uh, is that students tend to be underprepared for math. And math is a huge stumbling block for students going into all of STEM, but particularly for the geosciences, which I'll talk a little about in just the next slide. But essentially, 76% of all STEM students at the two-year college requires some form of pre-gatekeeper math class. What does that mean? That means a class before they even get to the math class that prevents them from getting into the STEM classes that they need to take, right? So if Calc 1 is the first class they need as a prerequisite for taking a physics class, they don't, they're not even ready for that, right? They have all these other classes. And that's true for all of our institutions, but it's even more acute at the two-year colleges where 36% of them are actually at the developmental level. So they don't even actually, they're not even actually at the college level when they're entering into the two-year college situation. So this becomes that much more of a challenge to get into, into any STEM domain, but particularly for the geosciences. So if we can figure out what factors allow them to keep persisting, then maybe we can assure that they can be more successful. So if we take a look at persistence specific to research in geology, you'll see I've color coded some of this. So garnet research is garnet colored. Um, and then some of the other research that we have is not. Um, but uh, what we know is that students in introductory geology classes discover geology when they're taking it at the college level. So if we think about the fact that they're coming in underprepared for math, that becomes kind of a big deal because they don't even know geology exists until they take it in their hopefully their freshman year, but sometimes it's their junior year. So, you know, when they're discovering geology can sometimes, again, be a, a, a barrier. Um, Garnet research has showed that students are primarily, sort of reinforces that, that they're primarily enrolling because they need a general education credit, but that they're also taking it because it sounds interesting. So there's actually an interest factor that's potentially building that we can build from, but you also see a different subset of population of students who are taking it because it's going to be the easier science, right? So, and we actually see their motivational metrics are different for those two subpopulations. Not really surprised, probably, but that's what we're learning. So, uh, more than a quarter of all successfully graduating geology majors took some of their coursework at a two-year college. So, we already see that there's students who are successfully making this transitional process. So, we know that students are taking classwork at the community college and that they're successfully going on to become geology majors. Um, in our Garnet work, we did look within classrooms what's happening in geology classrooms and probably representative of many different domains, we see that there's a broad spectrum. We have students that we, uh, we have classrooms where we see instructors or what we call a teacher, um, what is it, teacher centered. So teacher spending most of the time talking, primarily lecture based classroom. We had transitional classrooms where students are starting to talk to each other a little bit, maybe some clicker questions, a couple think pair share kinds of questions, but still predominantly a lecture based classroom. And then we had some more student centered classrooms where essentially students are spending more of the time talking to each other than they are being talked at. So that's sort of how we categorize these different classrooms. Um, then when we take a look at sort of individual classroom overlaps, we see some of the reasons students get into geosciences and sometimes the reason they leave has much to do with uh, both their prior experiences, things that they experienced. I like to go camping, I like to be outside, those are my experiences growing up. Things about connection to the earth, so that I have this strong tie to want to help the environment. Um, connection to people, including instructors. So this becomes important, right? If they're introductory, introductory they're introduced <coughs> to geology in that first college class, their science class, that instructor can make a big difference, but also can be a reason for leaving the geosciences. So that can make a difference. So ultimately, what I want to know is what individual and classroom factors affect student persistence, and ultimately, do we matter? So does the instructor play any kind of a role in that? So how do we measure this? So motivated strategies for learning questionnaire, gold standard in measuring motion, notions of motivation and use of strategies. There are some issues associated with it, but 
for the purpose of this, it's one of the ones that's been compared across many different domains, many different disciplines, a lot of different places. We looked at two variables, self-efficacy. Dan did a great job of describing it in a much slower way earlier today. But essentially, it's how confident do you feel in your ability to do this particular topic? Um, and then also control of learning beliefs. So do you believe that you're capable of actually doing this content? We uh, put it into a super category, what we called expectancy, which of course then lends itself to our expectancy value framework. Um, I also looked at the, some of the survey data we collected from the Garnet project. Specifically, the likelihood of taking another geology class. So rather than actual persistence, this is intent to persist. Um, and then I also looked at interest in science. It was a global measure, and I'll talk about what the problems with that are in just a second. And then also math self-concept, because I wanted to see how math might play a role. Math self-concept is a measure that's sort of a general confidence towards math. So it's not specific to a specific math class, but do you Feel conf do you feel like math is a class that you do well in? So things about their general aptitude in math. Um, in addition, for the classroom measure, we use the Reform Teaching Observation Protocol, affectionately known as the RTOP, uh, essentially measures classroom pedagogy. So I sort of described that notion of that we had the faculty-centered, transitional, and student-centered. It's out of a 100-point po score. Uh, there's two of us, very well calibrated to each other, traveled across the country and looked at college classrooms across the country to get this categorization scheme. But essentially, less than 30 was a faculty-centered, transitional, 30 to 50, student-centered, greater than 50. Our high score was about an 88, is I think where we topped out. And then, of course, looking at institutions, I did a comparison between Research One institutions and community college, so try and get kind of sort of extreme opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, just a quick little note on limitations. The RTOP was correlated with grade, so that's a good thing, except that uh, the grade varied in terms of how it was assessed. So in more traditional classrooms, it tended to be more exam-based. In more student-centered classrooms, there were alternate places where students could get grades. So there may be a little bit of a covariance that's going, kind of going on within there. Uh, the spring 2013 data set for the two-year college comparison that I used the mass self-concept analysis only has 78. That's like the bare minimum you can use to be able to use the structural equation model um, that I'm about to talk about. Interest was a global measure. This goes back to when a bunch of geologists get together and talk about doing education research. Sometimes we don't always do it right. And it wasn't until we brought the experts in later and said, oh, this is why we have experts in education. Um, and so uh, research shows very clearly that uh, there's different kinds of interest. It's subject specific, but you work with the data you have, not the data you wish you had. Um, and intent to persist is not necessarily actual persistence. However, there is a pretty good correlation between those who uh, say that they're likely to persist and those who ultimately do persist. So there is a, at least a correlation between that. So if we analyze student data at the student level, how can we use these independent variables to examine notions of persistence? Just sort of a small notion of measurement process. Uh, typically, we think about it regression, right? We sort of have our means, look at correlation, but of course, correlation does not cause, lead to causation necessarily. But we can say, oh, there's a high correlation between self-efficacy and intent to persist. Great. But it doesn't necessarily tell as strong of a story. But when you have larger numbers, it allows you to use a structural equation model. Structural equation models, we look at variances and covariances and look at all the variables between them all. Um, and as a result, we can actually, because we're mapping it onto a theoretic, theoretical construct, it allows us to make predictive claims. So we can actually look at what's the likelihood of somebody pursuing a particular path. So we can actually start to make some of those predictions. And so we use what I like to call the spaghetti diagrams. I'm not going to show you any spaghetti diagrams. But uh, essentially, you know, you look at different variables and what they, how they map onto a particular construct. So with that, looking at the notion of value and expectancy for theoretical framework, what can we determine from this full data set that we have? For the two-year college students, what I found was that 45% of the variance in intent to persist was predicted by interest alone. None of the other variables played a role. So um, essentially, students must be interested in the course in order to take another one. So self-efficacy didn't matter. Control of learning beliefs didn't matter. Mass self, uh, well, we'll come back to mass self concept. For the research one students, 40% of the variance in intent to persist was by interest, but 16 was by self efficacy. So that means that research one students had more options of reasons why they would take another geology class. So there's essentially a little bit more freedom 
for the ability to persist as opposed to there's much more of a restriction on those students at, at the two-year colleges. Um, so then does the instructor play a role in this process? Well, so this is a little bit tricky, but if we look at the teacher-centered data for uh, teacher-centered type classrooms at R1 institutions, we found that 41%, so still interest is the only thing that predicts it, um, but it's 41% of the variability. But when we look at a transitional classroom, we now, now see that it's a lower number. So it starts to lower the need for interest to persist. So essentially, we're starting to kind of balance that out a little. Maybe they'll take another class. They don't need to be as interested. Now, the, uh, the student-centered classroom started getting complicated. I don't have time to talk about it today, so I'm not going to talk about it today. But the transitional classroom at two-year colleges, we note we didn't actually have any low RTOP classrooms for the, uh, the two-year college student uh, population. And we could talk about what that means, but I'd like to think that it just means because we're more teacher-centered, we're just a little bit more advanced. But we could argue that later. Uh, so 57% of the transitional classrooms means, uh, so you need to have a really high interest if you're in a transitional classroom, whereas we see the same trend in a student-centered classroom, 38%. So it starts to lower that again. So they don't need to be as interested in order to intend to persist. So we matter, yay. Uh, so basically what we do in the classroom has an effect on whether students intend to persist. Awesome, okay. What is the role of math? Well, if we, when I add math self-concept into the model, interest is still the only predictor. Um, but what we see is a, a variability in how much it plays a role in that aspect. So it's sort of moderating the process. What it does is it actually dampens the student interest. So essentially, students need to have a higher interest if they have a low self-concept in math. So it's actually impacting that interest level. Um, now, looking at classroom data, I used hierarchical linear modeling. They just talked about that in the last data set. But essentially, we need to recognize that students are nested within classrooms. So one set of students, different set of students, when we're looking at the classroom level, we need to recognize that a whole set of students may be at a different place. So we can kind of think about each individual student is a little bit different, but this whole class may be on a whole different level than this particular class, right? So hierarchical linear modeling allows to account for that process. So what we looked at was, does the instructor play a role? Well, instructor level is 11% of student final grade, and 89% was at the student level. So that should make sense based on the research we have. Scott Freeman did an excellent paper synthesizing all this research and said, yeah, actually a full letter grade difference for students that are in active learning classrooms versus in traditional classrooms, right? So this actually reinforces what the research already says. But what we then did, and this is the power of really large data sets, we then looked at instructor pedagogy, so how reformed is the teaching classroom, student expectancy, so the motivation variable, and the grades, so how does it affect performance? How do all those three interplay? And what we do see is that student motivation declines across the quarter, pretty much across the board, except for really high performing students. And we like to think of that as calibration. Students come in like, yeah, I'm gonna do great. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> and the lower performing students, of course, right, have a higher recalibration than others do. Um, but ultimately what we see, and this is sort of a messy diagram, but it represents three different ellipsoids that represents 90% 90 90 of the data from three different subsets of classrooms. One of which is the teacher center classroom, one of which is the transitional, and one of which is the student centered. And then of course the slopes representing for each of those for the meet, or the slopes of the, the course. So what we see, change in expectancy. So this would be a positive change. This is a negative change from pre to post performance and grade. Essentially what we see is that high performing students doesn't really matter what we do in the classroom, they're gonna be high performing students. The lower performing student, it raises their performance, but it also flattens that change in expectancy. So ultimately what we do in the classroom helps some of those students that might come in having lower self-efficacy to be more successful, but also not necessarily require as much efficacy in order to be successful and also to then think about persistence. Um, so ultimately, the more student-centered the classroom, the less important student incoming expectancy is. And that's really powerful, because that means that those students who might be the underrepresented students, those students who self-doubt themselves, are more likely to be successful in those classrooms that engage them in those student-centered types of activities.
So this is, these are the underrepresented types of students we really want to target and make sure are successful. So that's a really powerful message. So what is our take home message? What's our take home meal? Instruction matters, yay! All that hard work is worth it. If we develop, so first of all, developing sustained interest does not mean just having a fun show. Um, I can be entertaining all day long, but it doesn't mean I'm helping sustain my student interest. It means that they are actually engaging in meaningful conversations with each other, that we're challenging them in ways that they feel supported, but also in the way that they're able to learn successfully. If you're not tending to motivation, persistence may be affected, and ultimately their, their course outcomes of success and their interest and motivation variables. In addition, this math factor is something I think we really need to think about in terms of how do we support our students to feel successful in their capability of doing math across the curriculum so that their ability to be successful once they go into those math classrooms continues to meet with success so they can start to build that math self-concept. Thank you. Thank you.